uh, did a really annoying thing and fixed someone's name incorrectly for me, so make sure that that's right first. Um, I, yeah, so I work with metadata at Cornell, and I am here to present on behalf of two of my colleagues that were really excited to get this presentation accepted, but were well, uh, unable to make it to Germany, so they send their apologies. But I'm here presenting the work of uh, Javed, Muhammad Javed, who is a, a, an ontology engineer and semantic uh, applications developer. Sorry, I have my speaker notes here. So. Uh, at Cornell University, and then Sandy Payette, who is the Director of IT Research and Scholarship at Cornell University. And we're going to be talking today about visualizing um, scholarly output, the drive of uh, visualization-driven navigation of scholarly data, or the project name is Scholars at Cornell. So we're talking specifically about that. Scholars Cornell is a project at Cornell University where we are hoping to uh, capture and manage, enhance, display, serve up, uh, at the scholarly output of Cornell University. We mean this as a whole. It's building off of previous work at Cornell on the Vivo platform, which I'll mention a little bit more in, in a couple of slides. Um, but to really not look so much at just singular faculty profiles, although that's part of it, but to really to have the library help manage and curate and expose scholarly output of the university. And so with that, um, we're sort of in phase one development. Uh, we have a test uh, demo up, which hopefully we will work and we'll see later. Um, but with this phase one development, we're looking to provide high integrity semantic knowledge base, which will then enable exploration and navigation of the scholarly record of Cornell University. Um, and then the discovery of expertise, impact, and collaboration, whether existing or um, possible, of, of Cornell faculty and researchers. So that's a lot of words, what, what, what do we mean? Uh, so we're looking to really provide a nice interface to say this is the impact of Cornell's research on the world. Um, we wanna grow faculty engagement in this work. So we are Cornell University, we have a Vivo instance. Vivo actually started at Cornell some years ago. Um, Vivo is a researcher profiling system built with Java and linked data in the back. Um, it's had mixed engagement from various uh, departments at Cornell due to just the, the data was, um, there was a lot of duplicates, there was a lot of where is the, does the faculty member updated here, or updated there, what's going on with this? And so scholars at Cornell is looking to possibly reboot engagement with faculty members by thinking about faculty curation and ownership from the beginning. Um, they also wanted to serve as a data and visualization service um, that is motivated by patterns in data and the best I can understand uh, of this work is that we're looking for um, improved data algorithms to match and merge many different sources of scholarly description and data about our faculty members. We'll see some of those data sources in a second. Uh, to find patterns and algorithms and semi-automated uh, pathways to get that data cleaned up, merged in uh, some sort of format that can work in the platform and then exposed. So it started, um, the Scholars at Cornell pro uh, project has started and really focused on who are the stakeholders, particularly internally, for this, this uh, reboot. Um, one of them we think, you know, library, obviously, we have a couple uh, different questions we might ask of this platform. Academic departments is a key uh, internal stakeholder, students, and then the university as a whole. What do we mean by this? Um, well, for library stakeholders, uh, for example, we really want to be able to serve up uh, data and visualizations and information that would answer questions like, well, what journals and resources are faculty members targeting? What are they really using? We know we have that one person that always wants to send you purchase requests for something, but does that really capture what the scholarly output is and where people are, where our researchers are focused? Um, are those resources covered in catalog and repositories? So are we getting appropriate access in some way? Are we purchasing incorrectly? Uh, and what should we prioritize for various uh, efforts, such as open access efforts or preservation initiatives? Uh, for academic departments, it's really a sort of a reporting tool. Uh, they want to know uh, questions. In this academic departments, we mean like deans and department chairs and academic staff. Um, they want to get questions like how many articles are out there, how much research is occurring, where is it being published, how often do we collaborate with other departments, what does that look like. Um, a lot of grant uh, reporting information that's possible in this work, and we'll see some examples of that. 
And then uh, what research areas are, are being covered or are emerging? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, chemistry is always going to be a chemistry department, but perhaps there's some emerging subdomain within that that we now want to consider getting more faculty for or supporting in some other way. For students, um, and we, scholars is more focused at PhD level and graduate students at this point, but that's not to say it couldn't expand. For students, we're really thinking about how can we help you find experts in research areas, especially when, when there's so much cross-departmental and cross-discipline um, work going on now. How can you find someone who might be interested in a particular subset? Ask them to be your supervisor, hopefully. Um, and also look at various emerging scholarly out areas and find articles on it. And we're focusing very much on articles in phase one, so you'll see that quite a bit. For the university, we want to know, and I've said this pretty much before, what do we, we want to know what the high impact areas of Cornell work are and what our global impact is, any emerging trends, and, and collaboration opportunities. So with that background, we get a little bit into what data goes into this system, what is scholars, and what, what data can we leverage within it. Scholars at Cornell right now pulls data from a couple different sources. We have our existing Vivo production instance, which we're looking at to see if we can possibly pull and leverage some data from that. Um, Vivo, again, is our faculty profiling researcher system. It's got some data in it. Can we pull that? Can we clean it up? Can we get it usable for this new system? Um, we definitely are looking at, are pulling stuff from OSP, is Office of Sponsored Research at Cornell University. They give us all their grant data, so we can pull that in and merge it and have information about that in the system. Uh, we pull information from human resources. This is where we really capture all of the de departmental affiliations and status of our faculty members and researchers. Um, we pull information from the registrar to see what kind of course loads are occurring or, or that sort of output. And then at the core of scholars at Cornell is going to be the symplectic elements feeding into a new Vivo instance. And we're looking at symplectic elements for this to manage all of the various streams of data and to help with merging, but also be an access point for faculty members to uh, own articles so they can go in and say, yes, that's my article. Yes, this is me. Because often you, we all have seen where articles have, you know, Smith JS as the, the article or the author name. And is that this person here? Well, you know, you'd be surprised how many Smith JSs there are in like a particular uh, work area. So, symplectic elements serve, uh, serves in that way, and then we serve that up to scholars, which is another Vivo instance. This is a slightly uh, different diagram that shows a little bit more how the data gets pushed back and forth. Um, you can see that uh, hand creation. Um, we, we have a, a symplectic elements, which is elements 5.0, really serving as that linchpin for data refinement cleaning, uh, access point for faculty members to self-curate, and then it goes into a cache and feeds into scholars. Um, the only data I'm aware of, and I, I would need to conf uh, have this confirmed, that doesn't go through that elements uh, section right now would be the HR data, which is where we say this is the person's name and their affiliation within the college and that sort of thing. Uh, that sort of information. And that does get eventually pushed back to elements. So this is a slightly different view on that data structure. Let's see if I missed anything. Um, and what happens with this structure is after elements, what gets cached and then pushed to scholars is what we're calling an Uber record. Um, it's basically where we've merged all these sources and made a record that can then serve uh, as clean, curated, accessible data in scholars. So this Uber record is we, we take information from Web of Science, which we're particularly heavily using in this, um, this test instance, that gets pulled into symplectic elements, gets curated by faculty members. We take information from the um, HR records that are coming in. We directly query the Oracle database behind a couple different campus systems to get information about grants or teaching efforts or whatever. Have that go into that Uber record and then push that into scholars. This is just the start of a sample Uber record because, you know, since I was talking about it, um, not particularly exciting except for it is clean data going into a system. It's aggregated. Um, so you can see here a little bit of what's going on. If you want to see a full one, I can pull a sample full one for you. But it's, it's not really the heart of this. What the heart of this is, in my opinion, and for this conference, Scholars is building very much off the Vivo model and ontologies. So you can see here, this is the modeling for 
um, one of the people, persons, that would be managed in scholars and that would have connected to it eventually grants, departments, uh, research outputs, articles, which we all would then also manage in uh, scholars. So you can see we have both person, we have information that comes from the HR department that gets asserted on it, it gets related to positions, which we would manage from the HR data as well, and then we would start to apply more information according to these other data sources. Like this, um, this is where we, so this is relatively simple, but actually has been quite powerful for the visualizations we're going to see. This is where we have a person who is the author of an article. From the article data that we get from Web of Science or elsewhere, but primarily Web of Science right now, we get the journal name. From the journal name, we get any sort of subject assignments. We then have inferred the subject assignments attached back to both the article and the person. Not perfect, but it gets us a place to start with visualizing this data. And this doesn't indicate expertise, it just indicates that they've written something on this topic. So the partnerships with Cornell have been, are, with the faculty are extremely important for this process to work. Um, it means that they need to go in and check and harvest and, and curate and look at it and really take part in building their own scholarly um, portfolio. Now I'm going to um, test the fates and see if I can show you something on the site. And if it fails, don't worry, I took screenshots because internet failing at a library technology conference is a bylaw at this point. Nope, that's not what I want. Sorry, I just showed someone else's. Um, so this is the homepage for scholars at Cornell. You can see, uh, if we scroll down, uh, we've got a couple different entry points for how you might start accessing the data captured here. Um, you can go in and start looking around uh, according to, well, I'm going to skip this. because I, What I really want to show you is these are the types of visualizations all built with D3 that are pulled in from that Uber record data that goes into this system and it is managed underneath with all of the data modeling and such we saw before. Um, you could see we've got, uh, keyword clouds are just ubiquitous now, but we've got those, we can figure out collaborations. Research grants have been really interesting thing to sort of harvest and play with that data to see what's going on. And person to subject area, which we're going to look at, but I want to first, Go, find, go dig into academic units so you can see what it looks like. Uh, we've got quite a few different academic units, some of which you, you know, might argue aren't necessarily that, but we've got those here that you can start to navigate through. Um, I'm going to go to college, and this has primarily the College of Engineering data in it right now because the scholars team has been partnering with them quite closely as a test case. It's working okay so far, thank God. We've got departments underneath, and for each de department or unit, you could have visualization at that level as well, but I'm going to drill down. Here we've got faculty members. Now let's see if this will work for us. This should be a visualization of all the faculty members at Cornell, or in that mining school of biomedical engineering. Faculty members are in the middle, and then those subject assignments that we were talking about get out here on the edge. So if I was to click on one person, he becomes a center all of a sudden. I can see what he's been working on. That's, that's the topic. Let me see if we can go back. You can reach over. And then what pops out are other people that have also worked on that topic. You can sort of dig into this, play around with it as much as you like. Um, but if I click on the faculty member's page, you see we get a page in scholars for this person, which also means we have a URI that we manage for this person. Um, and one of the things we're doing with the scholars going forward is to make sure that those URIs are persistent so that other universities can continue to query it, but indicate if a faculty member is no longer at Cornell. Uh, the other thing I want to show really quickly, oh, I've got to get back. Oh, come on, please. Okay. So if we are back in engineering, I'm going to go back to my next school because I know that one works for me. Something else you could sort of look at, if it can come up, and it's going to take a second to load. These are the grants that are associated with that department vis-a-vis -vis the faculty member information. Uh, if you hover over it, you see the name for the grants. You can click on it, get more information, click on the grant. And we have another record in Scholars as well as a URI for that particular grant application. And we have that linked to the faculty members through <clears throat> through that HR data. Um, one final thing, 
<clears throat> I would like to show, if I can get it to work, uh, is the uh, possibility for collaboration. Let me go back. So we do want to support people collaborating. This shows how many times someone from a particular department has collaborated with someone else in a particular de other department at Cornell. Um, you've got engineering department in the middle. You've got the, the high level uh, code names pulled from um, uh, H or Cornell organizational data for the departments. And then you've got further on, like sub, sub departments or units within it. You can hover over and see how many projects or something they collaborated on together. Click on that, you get a new visualization where you have the people in their department and what they were up to. So this is meant to help support both showing how we're interacting with each other at Cornell, but one of the phase two goals for this is to actually extend it to have it show collaborations with other universities as well. Um, so let me go back to PowerPoint. So luckily the demo worked, yes. <laughs> That's all I wanted, so now I can you know, die happy. But um, going through the screenshots, there are screenshots in there in case. Uh, exposing data going forward, um, we don't have a Sparkle endpoint at present, but built into Vitro and Vivo um, are uh, a, a variety of APIs, and so that's something that is actively being developed. Um, we do want other universities to start seeing that they can use this data. The context of Cornell's scholarly output, maybe Harvard wants to see it and see like, how it compares or what's going on. That's, that's something we're actively thinking about building out. Um, and like I mentioned before, we're keeping those URIs now in per, uh, perpetuity, where we did not with uh, the previous Vivo. If they left Cornell, we basically no longer manage the URI. So if you want to know more about this presentation, you should really contact um, Javed, because he's brilliant, and he's the guy behind especially all of the visualizations. That's his email right there. Um, thank you for dealing with me presenting his work, and I appreciate y'all's attention. Actually, <clears throat> before I ask the question, I wanted to ask your very last remark, you know, ring the bell for me. Oh, yeah. Which said that, <laughs> well, not necessarily in a good sense. Oh, okay. That uh. You say that if somebody leaves Cornell, then his or her URI is not managed anymore? Absolutely. So what I can tell you about that, and this is something I can speak authoritatively about, so thank you. Um, <laughs> one of the things we tried to do at Cornell was pull URIs for faculty members into our MARC records leveraging the subfield zero. That's an entirely separate project, but it's a context for the answer I'm giving you. Um, we would want to pull that in particularly for dissertations so that we could have an identifier for that faculty member and we ne don't necessarily have an ORCID ID or a name authority file record from Library of Congress. When I started running that reconciliation process and trying to do some updating and some entity resolution stuff, I all of a sudden got a bunch of 404s. <laughs> and I was like, what? What is going on? And that's where I uncovered that there was sort of a evolving process over time of the, the data was still stored somewhere, but the URIs were no longer exposed. And we were like, this, this, is, <laughs> this is a problem for our, our workflows in particular, but hey, could you reconsider that decision? Um, with scholars, they're saying, yes, that, that's, that is no longer going to be the case. Okay, it will not be. So they're, good. Yep. That, that, good. Sorry for the long story, but yeah, no, okay. that's the that's, context that's great. of it. Um, now, yeah. my original question, I'm sorry, because this yeah, is just course. triggered here. Um, how should I put it? So how much of that is corner specific? It's entirely uh, Cornell specific right ah, now. So, comes the standardization person. What I would like to see if I do a scholarly publication, mm -hmm. okay, and I can convince at last my publisher that he, they would put up proper metadata for journals and authors, etc. Mm -hmm. I would like that data to be in such a format that you could use it directly. So I want that type yeah. of metadata to be standardized enough that the scholarly community as a whole, Cornell included, could use it, could so, use it yeah. rather than having my, isolated yeah, silos. Absolutely, absolutely. My response to that would be twofold. Um, the actual model of the RDF data exposed to scholars is based off Vivo. And so that is 
a community ontology that we're extending and hopefully that can get wrapped in or who, who knows, so that, that's all uh, reuse where possible and clear modeling. For those Uber records, there's such an internal process for the merging and loading that I don't even know if we would want to expose those necessarily or just make sure we expose that really nice RDF data that comes out of the system. Uh, you know, everything probably not, but as much as possible should be general and not bound to a university, however great university So you that have is. A, a metadata person giving a presentation for a couple of programmers. Yeah, it should be generalized and it should follow standards, absolutely. Okay, any other questions? Come on. Oh, yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> maybe not a question, but a comment continuing to what you said. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Springer Nature are now publishing a gob of information on their journals and articles and so on in, the, in a project called SciGraph. And for now, they've selected not to reuse anything to make their mm -hmm. own ontology. I've spoken to them a couple of times. It, there are pros and cons to this. Mm -hmm. The big question is how established is Vivo and how well it covers the universe of science. Because before Vivo, there was Serif here in Europe. Okay, it's an XML model, but a very general model of relations between things, very generic thing. And a few years ago, there were attempts to RDFSize it. My understanding is that Serif is the foundation of current research information systems in Europe on a mass scale. It's also the data model behind open air, the European uh, articles, the portal for articles produced by Horizon 2020 and before that FP7. So um, I think that a lot of data modeling for this domain is kind of already done, but there just needs to be more coming together, especially between the states and Europe, I think. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'd be interested to help support any collaborations between us and others that would, these two in the front seem like you're particularly interested, but like we can, we can see what we can do together going forward. I would also say that the, the real force of scholars right now is not necessarily as much remodeling in the back as trying to figure out our priorities for what this, this application is meant to serve, and then having that data exposed so that reporting like, and visualizations can happen. Actually, just a remark on that. I may be mistaken, sorry if it's the case, but I think that there is a bibliography work done at schema.org. There is. Which may be you know, a way to standardize it and not making dependent. So right now, Scholars focuses on article data and data we can pull from Web of Science. Phase two definitely has within scope monographs and books. And what that's going to pull in is other projects at Cornell that are already looking at RDF modeling of that, um, in particular LD4L, which we'll be hearing about tomorrow from another very brilliant speaker. OK, uh, there is one question here. Yes, um, we got the first question via Twitter. Uh, oh, yay! <laughs> yeah, I invite anybody <laughs> watching the live stream to ask another question. So I will just read this out. Uh, it's by Christian Hauschke from T, uh, TEB currently, I think. Uh, can the person take their profile with them when they leave, for example, per via an ORCID synchronization? They could definitely export the data and pull it along. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if so taking the data, sure, um, their profile style staying up, I, I would presume so, but there will be some sort of indication on it that this is no longer a faculty member at Cornell, and we wouldn't still be collecting more information about them because they would no longer be in the HR systems or something like that. Um, it'd be an interesting comment or work area to see how we could, say if they moved to Harvard and they had something similar, how we could link those two. Still more? Just one short question. Uh, is this demo system uh, open uh, for everybody to, to have a look? Um, I believe so, and I'll triple check. The GitHub link is public. Um, I know it's on GitHub. I have to confirm that it's open, and then we can see. No, just this. Um, it's closed, now. Uh, it's closed now. OK, so we'll see if we can share it in some way. It, yeah. OK, would be great. It's really mm -hmm. great to browse. 
It's great work by someone who's not me, so I, I hesitate to comment on, on the openness of their code, but I don't see why we couldn't. <laughs> so, uh, but as I understood, so the, the website is open. It, uh, oh, no, the, <laughs> the website is a demo, and we're still figuring out the kinks, so you'll be asked for a password if you just like sneakily copied that URL from my browser, and I apologize for that. Oh, okay. Okay, I think we have for, uh, time for one more question. How do you cope with, uh, I would say, flux in your organizational data? I mean, the chair X moves to the institute, and the institute is moved to a different department. Uh, Professor A wrote a paper with Professor B. B wasn't at Cornell then, but he is mm -hmm. now the here. But the professor they're a visiting fellow. They yeah. change their title. Yeah, they get a special chair. No, um, so I would imagine with. So like I said, that this is a demo. And when I say that, again, it's because it's a demo tightly coupled with their partnership with the College of Engineering. And so I imagine at this point, they're just trying to figure out what kind of